Hello, and thank you for joining us on the Capitol Report today. I'm Steve Lance, and let's take a look at some of the stories we've been covering for you today. The House Freedom Caucus invites witnesses to testify on vaccine mandates. The witnesses and the lawmakers discuss the constitutionality and the economic impacts of the mandates. The Biden administration's mandates are on hold for now. We speak to Florida Congressman Byron Donalds to find out where this may be heading. Congress is back in session and Democrats are eager to push Biden's second round of massive spending. We take a look at the budget reports and how they add up. As vaccine mandates continue to face pushback throughout the country, with the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals halting the mandate on constitutional grounds, the House Freedom Caucus invited expert witnesses to testify before them. One of the witnesses that testified before the House Freedom Caucus was a medical doctor. She pointed out that federal vaccine mandates ignore natural immunity. We actually have about 122, probably more than that, studies now affirming natural immunity. And um, the problem is we're still relying on the CDC for all of their recommendations. Congressman Louis Gohmert emphasized that two of the three COVID-19 vaccines available in the U.S. are still only authorized for emergency use. There are no warnings, and that's because of those words I just read for emergency use authorization only, which means they don't have to give you the warnings. Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene said she's against vaccine mandates because they violate medical freedom. As a matter of fact, I consider them discrimination in the workplace, and it's also communism, absolute communism. The caucus asked the doctor what her opinion is on mandating the COVID-19 vaccine for young kids. There's no reason to vaccinate children for COVID. They are not at risk. Employers also told the lawmakers that the vaccine mandates would have devastating impacts on small businesses and would worsen the labor shortage. Florida Congressman Byron Donalds has been an outspoken supporter for medical choice and believes that the decision to get the vaccine should be between the patient and their doctor. We sat down with the congressman to get his thoughts. Here's part of what he had to say. Congressman Byron Donalds, thank you so much for joining us on the Capitol Report. Of course. Now, Congressman, I want to ask you about vaccine mandates. We went from mask mandates to vaccine mandates in a very short period of time. Um, right now, I want to ask you, you know, are we trusting the science? Are we trusting the government? How did we get here and where do you see us going? Well, look, I don't ever trust the government anyway, because the government is full of people who got elected, who want to look good, whether in their communities or on TV or in polls. The reality is, is that Joe Biden and the Democrats are not following the science. They're following political science. This idea that we're going to have zero COVID is not reality. But what is reality is we have therapeutics, we have vaccines, we have an ability for people to get over the worst effects of COVID-19. And the data is still clear that the people who deal with the worst effects of COVID-19 are literally about 3% of the population. The mortality rate is less than two, is less than one and a half percent of the population that gets exposed to COVID that we've tracked because we still have, we still have millions of cases that have gone undiagnosed because people didn't go get tested. So the mortality rate is actually very, very low. The therapeutics actually help our hospital systems. But when you mandate vaccines, what you end up doing is creating a scenario where people will refuse to follow or even consider the vaccine. It has a deleterious effect. And then when you put that burden on small business, also dealing with the fact of the other burdens that Joe Biden wants to put on businesses in our country, it's going to have a chilling effect on our economy. Now, Congressman, I want to ask you about the mandates. The Fifth Circuit put the stay on uh, Biden's order to you know, enforce his vaccine mandate on private companies. Um, OSHA who they were trying to push the uh, mandate through has just come out and said that they are going to acknowledge and cooperate with, uh, you know, the Fifth Circuit's decision. What do you make of this? I think the Fifth Circuit is right. And I think the other circuit courts are going to follow. Maybe not the Ninth Circuit. I mean, they, they're a little crazy out there. But for the most part, this is what you're going to see. Congress never gave OSHA that authority. It was never even thought of in Congress to give OSHA that authority. For Joe Biden and for his lawyers and attorneys in the White House and staffers to sit there and try to construe some way for him to get his way is outrageous. 
Also, in our country, we have something called HIPAA laws that have been completely ignored during COVID-19. There's never been a time where an employer ha tells an employee, oh, you must inject this before you come work at my company. There's never been a time where we frankly say, oh, you can't work here unless you take this. That's help. That's, that's medical discrimination. We would never allow that in the United States, but that's what Joe Biden has created. The Fifth Circuit is right. It is unconstitutional. My hope is, and what I perceive is going to happen, is that all the circuits are gonna come out with their ruling because there's lawsuits all over the place on this. It's gonna to go to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is gonna strike it down as unconstitutional. But here's the problem. Joe Biden knows this. He knows it's unconstitutional. What he's doing is playing catch me if you can with the United States Constitution. He knows what he is doing is wrong. He already said before he doesn't have the legal authority to do it, but he's doing it anyway because he's literally trying to scare businesses with the force of law and scare people with the force of law to do what they have not chosen to do in their ordinary lives. That is dictatorial. That is totalitarian. That is where the modern Democrat Party is. It is absolutely wrong. It's unconstitutional. And that's what the court is going to find. Carson, I want to just ask you about uh, with these mandates, if people uh, wind up, you know, God forbid, uh, getting ill or even dying down the line because of the vaccines, but yet they were forced to take it if they initially didn't want it, who's going to be on the hook uh, legally, is it going to be these private sector companies that had to force it and cooperate at a certain point? Is it going to be the government? What do you make of this? I mean, honestly, I believe it's both. You have, and, and it's going to be primarily the federal government. You have a government that is literally imposing its will on a free people. Like, we are a free people in the United States. The government has no authority to tell me what I'm going to inject into my arm. I wish they would. I'll tell you this, they can't do it in Congress because the House has its own rules. If Nancy Pelosi came out and said, I'm issuing a vaccine mandate, I would look at her and be like, oh yeah, go find somebody to do it. Because trust me, it's not going in my arm. And that's my opinion. That's my viewpoint. That's how, that's how I feel about this. But if you do this and somebody is harmed, then yes, the federal government is culpable for this. The White House is culpable for this. And unfortunately, the business owner probably will be as well. And so I, business owners need to take a long, hard look at this. Don't follow Joe Biden down a road that goes against the very fabric of our nation. It goes against the very fabric of our nation. And don't tell me like, oh, well, we make kids take vaccines. We mandate vaccines. First of all, that's policy that is set at the state level. Vaccines in schools are set at the state level. State legislators vote on this after years of study associated with the vaccines and with a lot of data showing the mortality rates with kids associated with, we, with these vaccines. In the United States military, when you sign on to be a member of our armed forces, you also sign on the fact that you will take whatever vaccine that, you, that, that, uh, that, that they prescribe. You sign off on that as an adult going into the military. There's not an American that signed off anywhere that says that Joe Biden can tell them to take a vaccine. That's never occurred. So if somebody's harmed, the liability falls with him. And unfortunately, again, taxpayers are gonna to have to deal with the lunacy of Joe Biden. Congressman Byron Donalds, thank you. Anytime, thank you. The National Institute of Health, or NIH, has launched a study to investigate the long-term impacts of the CCP virus on children. The NIH says that they will track up to 1,000 children and young adults who previously tested positive for the CCP virus and evaluate its impact on their physical and mental health over three years. The study is expected to yield a detailed picture of its effects on the overall health of children, their development and immune responses to infection. The CCP virus is another name for SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19. Washington, D.C. will be lifting its indoor mask mandates on November 22nd. This is welcome news to gym goers and other businesses that flourish in a mask-free environment. Masks will still be required on public transportation, inside schools, as well as in certain D.C. governmental offices. And Congress is back in session this week. The House is moving ahead on their agenda to push step two of Biden's massive spending bill. This, some say, would fuel already skyrocketing inflation, but Biden says it won't cost a penny. Here to break down the costs, we have NTD's Melina Wisecup. Melina, what are some of the budget reports on this bill showing? 
The Congressional Budget Office is expected to release a full report on the budgetary effects of this overall bill by Friday, but the House could vote even earlier than Friday. Speaker Pelosi says she's planning a vote either Thursday or Friday. Now, based on the Congressional Budget Office report so far, they've looked at just a, a, um, some portions of this overall bill, and they're expecting around $300 billion in direct spending. Now, keeping in mind, this is just looking at only half of the bill so far. And some other reports do predict that if some of these social welfare programs are made permanent, it could lead to even several trillion dollars more in spending in the long run. Steve? So Democrats are pitching this bill as a bill for families. Melina, from what you've seen in these investments, does it look like the benefits for Americans will outweigh the costs? Well, Steve, I think it really depends on what you as an American citizen value. And if it does have an impact on inflation, are you willing to pay a bit more now for some goods and in return for um, in return uh, by getting some uh, extra help from the government as far as tax cuts and help with child care, help with health care costs? So these are the questions that, uh, that Americans really need to ask themselves when they're deciding whether or not they support this. And it's also a values question, I think, because in this bill, it would fund universal pre-K, but at the same time, this would mean more of a government say in these universal pre-K centers and what these children are being taught. And at the same time, with health care um, costs, so we know Medicaid and Medicare expansion will be part of this bill. And it depends on whether people are willing to pay more for, um, pay more in taxes or be willing to risk having a higher national debt in the future in order to get some of this expanded coverage. So I think that these are really the pros and cons that Americans really have to consider when they're deciding whether or not they support the spending bill. Steve? And this would be spending in addition to that historic infrastructure investment that Biden just signed into law earlier this week. And now Democrats on the Hill are immediately moving on to passing this other bill, nearly $2 trillion more this week. Uh, Melina, does it look like they'll get this done this week or even before the holidays for that matter? Today we did hear from the congressional leadership, Speaker Pelosi and Senate Majority Leader uh, Schumer, and they were saying that they have a goal to get this to Biden's desk by Christmas, and Pelosi is planning to hold a vote this week in the House. And they were also joined by some um, other House members, namely Representative Gottheimer, who is a key moderate vote in the House. And with his support alongside progressive support, it does look like it's very possible that this bill will pass the House by the end of this week. Now, as for its fate in the Senate, that's a that's a different story. We heard from Senator Manchin this week, who said that he's very concerned about the timing of this bill and its impact on inflation. So if Manchin is hesitant to give a yes, yes vote on this bill, it could lead to a stall at least for a little while in the Senate. Steve? Thanks for that, Melina. With the midterm elections coming, several high-profile members of Congress have said that they will not be seeking re-election next year. But there are some who will be running and may be in for a tough fight. It's time for me to come home. Time for me to be more than a weekend wife, mother, and friend. Representative Jackie Spare from California just announced she will not be running for re-election next year. This is the latest blow to the House Democrats, who are already expecting a difficult midterm run. Senator Patrick Leahy from Vermont also announced that he will not be seeking re-election, opening up another seat that Democrats will need to aggressively defend if they want to maintain a Senate majority. Leahy is 81 years old and has served eight terms in the Senate, holding the position for over 40 years. On the Republican side, Senator Lisa Murkowski of Alaska announced that she is running for re-election in 2022, setting up a tough battle as former President Trump vows to unseat her. The Wyoming Republican Party has voted to no longer recognize Congresswoman Liz Cheney as a member of their party. According to a local Wyoming newspaper, Casper Star Tribune, the measure passed the Wyoming GOP Central Committee by a vote of 31 to 29. The resolution is simply symbolic and does not strip Cheney of any power. Cheney has lost some of her base since she became critical of former President Trump following the January 6th Capitol breach. Her spokesperson said in a statement, quote, Sadly, a portion of the Wyoming GOP leadership allowed themselves to be held hostage to the lies of a dangerous and irrational man, end quote. Trump still holds a tremendous amount of political clout within the Republican Party, and he has endorsed Wyoming attorney Harriet Hegeman to primary against Liz Cheney. On Tuesday, Secretary of Homeland Security Alejandro Mayorkas 
told the Senate Judiciary Committee that the U.S. immigration system is broken. At the same time, he said that not all of the 1.2 million illegal immigrants with final removal orders should be deported. We cannot remove 1.2 million individuals. I would not necessarily accept the fact that all of them have received due process. Mayorkas went on to say it's impractical to deport so many people. He's also said that those who pose a public safety threat, a national security threat, or a border security threat should be removed from the U.S. The Biden administration has come under intense fire for its open border policy. Senator Chuck Grassley pointed out that the U.S. Customs and Border Protection recently announced that it had 1.7 million encounters with illegal immigrants at the southern border in fiscal year 2021. That's the highest number ever recorded. Of that number, the vast majority have occurred under the current administration. President Biden and CCP leader Xi Jinping held a virtual meeting. In their first meeting since Biden took office, the three and a half hour conversation doesn't appear to have led to any breakthroughs. And the Chinese Communist Party has blood dripping from their hands from multiple campaigns to eradicate religious and political dissidents. Could China's human rights abuses become the rallying call that brings down the Chinese Communist Party? Parents gather in the nation's capital demanding their right to a voice in their children's education. Some tell us that schools are helping students change their gender identities without their parents' knowledge or consent. President Biden and Chinese Communist Party Chairman Xi Jinping met in a virtual summit on Monday. The two opened the conference with friendly remarks despite the CCP's troubled relationship with countries around the world following the global pandemic outbreak that was unleashed from the communist nation. The two leaders met amid mounting tensions between the two countries. The U.S. has criticized China over its human rights abuses against Uyghurs, aggression toward Taiwan, and stamping out Hong Kong's pro-democracy protests. Biden laid out his goals. As I've said before, it seems to me our responsibility as leaders of China and the United States is to ensure that the competition between our countries does not veer into conflict, whether intended or unintended. Just simple, straightforward competition. Biden and Xi stressed their responsibility to other nations around the world to avoid conflict. Xi said the two countries should increase communication and cooperation. At the beginning of this three and a half hour conversation, Xi referred to Biden as his old friend. That's after Biden has said that the two were not old friends back in June. Press Secretary Jen Psaki also made a point to reemphasize that Joe Biden did not view Xi as an old friend in her White House press briefing shortly before the meeting. The two have not had a face-to-face meeting since Biden became president, and Chairman Xi has not left the communist nation since the outbreak of the CCP virus back in early 2020. This meeting did not lead to any major breakthroughs. That's according to a senior administration official. The official also said that the two had an extended discussion on Taiwan. The independent island nation is a key U.S. ally in a country the Chinese regime sees as its own territory that must be reunited with the mainland. The White House set low expectations for the meeting, and no major announcements or a joint statement were delivered. The Chinese Communist Party cares nothing more than about their image on the world stage. Despite state-run organ harvesting conducted on Falun Dafa practitioners, internment camps for Uyghur Muslims, and a whole host of other genocidal policies carried out by the CCP, for the most part, it's been business as usual when it comes to dealing with the Chinese Communist Party. Arizona Congressman Andy Biggs sat down with us to talk about China and more. Here's a look. Congressman Andy Biggs, thank you so much for joining us on the Capitol Report. Thank you. Good to be with you. Now, a lot of people say that China's Achilles heel, if you will, is their human rights record, uh, whether it's, you know, religious minorities or, you know, various things that they do to their people. Uh, how important do you think it is for Joe Biden to um, bring up human rights in China? Well, there's at least two really fundamental problems with China's human rights record. Number one is you've got the Uyghur Muslim population of over a million basically living in concentration camps, uh, denied all human rights by this by that, by the Chinese government, uh, actually the Chinese Communist Party, which is their government. The second thing is the amount of, of slave labor and forced labor, the conscripted labor in China. And America's businesses sometimes avail themselves of that extraordinarily cheap labor. 
those are two issues that if Biden really was interested in, uh, he should be raising those with China as well. Now, uh, there's been multiple lawsuits that have been filed against this mandate. Uh, recently, the one that was filed in the Fifth Circuit is um, getting a lot of attention. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what this could mean? Yeah, so in the Fifth Circuit, a whole bunch of companies and individuals filed suit against OSHA, and they, they won at the lower court level, and then it was, uh, uh, they enjoined the action. They, they temporarily stopped enforcement of the, of the OSHA rule. Then that uh, was taken up and appealed, and they won that three-judge three panel. And so we're waiting to see what's going to happen next. But for now, nationwide, implementation of the OSHA rule has been enjoined or stopped by uh, the, the Fifth Circuit Court. And how likely is it, in your uh, eyes, that this will be upheld, or do you see this going to the Supreme Court? Where do you see this going? Well, I suspect that the administration is going to keep appealing it and fighting because it's in. There's different lawsuits in in all but one circuit, is my understanding. I would imagine this that this administration is going to take this all the way up to the Supreme Court because ultimately this isn't about uh, health. This is about power and control, and they. This is clearly outside their scope of authority. It's outside the scope of OSHA, um, and it really, really um, detrimental to to legislative power. And I think the judiciary, judicial branch is going to rein them in. But the question is, how long will it take to get there? And uh, this administration, they want to overstep their executive authority clearly. And that's what they're trying to do here. Congressman Andy Biggs, thank you. Thanks, Sean. Parents stood alongside members of Congress in Washington, D.C. to demand parents' rights in students' education and to stop pushing for ideological transformation in the classrooms. Gender transition program, six pages, uh, deciding uh, which bathrooms to use, which pronouns to use when they would go on school field trips, whether to room with boys or girls, um, and the parents uh, had no idea. This policy says that public school can assist in the gender transition of your child without your consent. These members of Congress tell us that the solution is to withhold funding from institutions that aim to shove a wedge between the sacred parent-child bond with this modern technology. I'm all about cutting the funding, for God's sakes. The only thing that I've learned in my short 10 months up here in D.C. is follow the money, and if you pull the strings and you stop that appropriation, that gets their attention. So I think in Congress, I think focus on, focusing on removing a lot of these wealthy influences into the school district, a lot of money that often goes, for example, Merrick Garland's son-in-law. A lot of that money goes uh, to his publishing company that's selling critical race theory to these schools. Other advocates reminding parents to remember where the root of the problem lies. Never forget who we are fighting against. This effort of indoctrination and sexualization of your children and the grooming of your kids, it is being done by the communists. And don't let this moment stop here. Keep going. Keep fighting because God is on our side. A New Hampshire student is suing his high school after being disciplined for stating that there are only two genders. His attorney is seeking permanent relief from the school policy to protect the student's free speech and religious beliefs. And in Virginia, the Loudoun County School Board agreed to a court settlement barring it from punishing a school teacher. Tanner Cross had been suspended from teaching for voicing his disagreement with Loudoun County's transgender policy at a school board meeting. His lawyer stated that the policy forces teachers to violate their beliefs. A court settlement reinstates Cross and requires that the school board pay $20,000 in legal fees. According to AAA, 53 million people plan to travel over Thanksgiving. That includes over a million D.C. residents. According to AAA, 53 million people plan to travel over Thanksgiving. That includes over a million D.C. area residents. There will be six million more travelers than last year. The report suggested that airports and roads would be more crowded due to increased confidence from new safety measures and the reopening of borders for vaccinated travelers. Congressional Democrats are urging the White House to mandate that airlines require passengers to show proof of vaccination status against the CCP virus or a negative test before flying domestically. More than 30 Democratic lawmakers said in a letter to President Joe Biden that new requirements on passengers are a necessary and long overdue step toward ensuring all Americans feel safe and confident 
while traveling and reduce the chances of yet another devastating winter surge. Several senior Democrats signed on to the letter. And that's all we have for you on the Capitol Report today. Thank you for tuning in. I'm your host, Steve Lance, and we'll see you next time.